All right, thank you, Alice. Um, so, and uh, welcome everyone tonight to our uh, survival kit um, for media companies. And so I thought in the spirit of, uh, in the spirit of kind of this overriding technology theme and survival, I thought that we would maybe start this evening off with a bit of a rapid fire Q&A period where we see if we can go through maybe 10, 15 questions in a, a minute or two. Yeah. Up for that? <laughs> I will do my best. All right. So, this is like a dinner at home. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so Apple came out with their iPhone X or iPhone 10 today. So, iPhone 10 or Pixel 2? Pixel 2. Favorite food? Uh, Vietnamese pho. Favorite sports team? New York Yankees. Greatest athlete of all time? Ken Alepso. Um, <laughs> Derek Jeter. Uh, what book are you reading? Oh, I'm reading this 120 page history of Hong Kong, which uh, I'm struggling to get through. <laughs> Dog or, dogs or cats? Started off as cats, now, now dog, actually. Goodness, I hate admitting, it, admitting that. Do you play any musical instruments? I do, I play the piano poorly. <laughs> What's your most frequently used app? Uh, Gmail. Whiskey or wine? Whiskey. Meat or vegetables? Meat. Morning or evenings? Oh, uh, evenings. <laughs> any role models? Uh, it's bad that I'm struggling here. <laughs> too many to name. Yeah, too, yeah thank you. Too right, many to name. <laughs> Marvel or DC? Uh, Marvel. Marvel, okay. Uh, PC or Mac? Mac. iPhone or Android? Android. Amazon or Alibaba? Uh, <laughs> is, is there a correct answer to that question? <laughs> I was referring purely to the uh, cloud hosting uh, platform in China. So oh, yeah. I thought I'd, uh, then, then Alibaba. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Thank you for that. I, I, uh, I feel like you survived. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so uh, I guess, you know, coming to, uh, I guess, your background. So you spent a number of years. I guess your, uh, largely your career has been in tech most of the time. I, I think you started with, was it actually AOL at one point as well? Yeah, I started off with Google, but I was at AOL for a, literally a hot minute. Okay, so yeah, so Google, AOL, you had Spotify. It's figuratively a hot minute. Just, I know there might be grammar and that's Nazis in this room, so I just want to be careful. <laughs> Figuratively, a hot minute. So you're at, I guess, the epicenter of tech, working with some of the world's largest companies in the U.S. And so, you know, what are you, what on earth are you doing out here in Asia with an old, perhaps wrinkly newspaper? Uh, good question. I think the the easy answer to this is is really two parts. The first is that there's a practical reason why I'm out here. Practical reason being that I've been a news junkie my entire life, and I absolutely love the business of news. I love the product of news. I love what it represents and what it means to the world and, and, and how much we as human society need it. And I've always wanted to, to be deeply embedded in this industry. And if I want to be in the news industry and I want to grow a news company, there are very few in the world that I can choose that are in the path of growth. And South China Morning Post happened to be one of those. And so when a company like the South China Morning Post, with the legacy that it has, with the resources that it now has, and with the ambition of the organization calls, uh, it's a call that for someone like me, I had to take, and I had to very, very critically, very honestly think about, and the opportunity itself was too good to pass. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the practical reason. The more emotional and personal reason is that uh, I am Asian American, that's the easiest way to describe me, although Actually, answering the question of where I'm from is much more complicated. Um, actually, someone asked me that earlier tonight, and I failed to answer because I think I was, I was uh, hurried along and I couldn't get the answer out. But here's the short version of it. I was born in Southern California. My parents are, are Taiwanese, or they are Taiwanese white. So my grandparents retreated to Taiwan with the Kuomintang uh, army. Right after I was born, we moved back to Taiwan lived there for five years, then I went to New Zealand and grew up for 10 years in Auckland, New Zealand. Then I went to New Jersey for high school, and then uh, effectively after that stayed for about 20 years in the United States. Okay, here's the reason I get the context. It's because I've grown up in Western culture, but with very, very deep Chinese roots. And I have been frustrated my entire life with not only how poorly other people understand my culture, but also how poorly I understand my culture and context. And I understand my culture and context poorly, I think, 
because of the fact that I've been educated in a different place. And it's been very, very hard to access what I believe to be a nuance and texture truth about China, about this region of the world. And so the emotional and personal reason is to be able to participate in defining, I think, if we do our job right at the SCMP, to help define how the next generations understand China and hopefully understand China more comprehensively and better, to be able to have a hand or to, to play a part in how my future kids will be able to understand and learn about China all over the world as global citizens, that's something that I absolutely could not pass up. Mm -hmm. so, so what was the scope? I, I guess when you were first presented with this opportunity, I guess how, how much of it did you understand at that time versus say, after you had agreed to join and kind of a few months later, how, like, has it changed from you know, what you first thought of it to kind of where you were a little bit later? I would like to think I did enough due diligence that I didn't come in here blind. Yeah. Um, so I, I do think that I haven't been surprised mm -hmm. by much since I got here. There have been small things here and there, um, including how how easy it was to get to to, to uh, get used to Hong Kong, actually. But in general, my understanding of what the business was, the struggles that not only the industry but the company was in, and the, the vision of the organization, especially with new owners, none of that has changed. Mm -hmm. So when, that vi when the vision of the new owners, when, when you started speaking to them, how much of, I guess, your personal vision could you kind of attach to that or join alongside that vision? Yeah, I, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, initially, it was a lot of listening on my part, mm -hmm. which I'm terrible at. But I did a lot of listening, and I understood from not only the board of the South China Morning Post, the previous CEO as well, and the executive team at this company, what the vision was for SCMP in the future, which is to help the world understand China better. That's not technically our vision statement, but that is what, how they articulated it. And that really resonated with me, which is why I'm here. Since then, I have been able to, with the executive team, actually refine that and articulate it in a way that is much more practical for the organization. So our mission statement today is to lead the global conversation about China. Fantastic. Um, so let's let's take a step back here and look at, I guess, the, the industry as a whole. So again, your background in tech. Now, I guess, what would you say are the, I guess, the largest disruptors to media? There's a number of things going on, but what are you really focused on? Well, the, the, the main change, and this is a holistic disruption, is the fact that consumer behavior has completely changed from 20 years ago to now because of the internet. And what's really frustrating for traditional industries like ours is that not only are we trying to play catch up, the, the actual consumer behavior is changing every six months. So even the great organizations, and they're few and far between when it comes to traditional media, uh, that, are catch, that are caught up, they, they, they've caught up probably to what the industry was like a year and a half ago. So there's a constant lag. A constant lag. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that is the holistic change, right? It's the fact that consumer behavior has changed. The reason consumer behavior has changed and continues to change is because the way people discover content and the way that people consume, read, watch, listen to content, the platforms that they use are different and they're, they're, they're constantly changing. Yeah. So, so, so how do you manage that? I mean, I guess you're coming from an industry where you have physical pieces of paper. Um, to now where there are multiple discovery um, platforms, aggregators, there's so many different ways that people can access content. How is that, how are you approaching that? I think we have to understand the product of news in this day and age, and we have to change our definition of what the product of news looks like. Mm -hmm. Not how you gather news, not what objective news looks like, but the actual end product, user product of news. And it's something that I, I've talked about. I think there are a few people that I met during the, um, the, the, the drinks earlier uh, that attended my FCC talk, and I specifically talked about the product news. So I apologize in repeating myself a little bit. The product of news today is the permutations of the right content with the right packaging for the right distribution channel. Mm. And that is just something that the newspaper industry in the past didn't really have to think about because the product had stayed exactly the same for so long that the entire process of 
uh, gathering the news, to writing the news, to uh, printing the news, to distributing the news, to the experience that you and I have with news, all of it vertically integrated, singular companies owned it, and they could control the entire stack. That's just not the world we live in anymore. Mm -hmm. So I guess, well, let's look at, I guess, those different facets of, I guess, the, the different stages of news. So on the collection or gathering of news, how is technology changing that aspect of it? Everything's much faster, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so the collection of news, um, it, it's, it's not only is everything much faster, you can do it from practically anywhere. So when you used to be, when you're a field reporter, you were a field reporter. You were out in the field. You were doing interviews. You were actually witnessing what was happening in the world. And then you were rushing over to either, you know, so you send a telegram, you make a phone call, and then you have uh, effectively other journalists, other co copywriters uh, at home office jotting down what you're saying, and then it goes through copy editing process, right? Um, other times you're sitting in your home office, you're making calls, you're doing interviews over the phone, uh, and then you're taking down everything that is being said, and then you're formulating that into a story. Now we have a generation of journalists and groups of people who can sit in front of a computer and can report on the world without ever moving from their seat, without ever picking up a phone to talk to anyone. They can report on the news, ostensibly report on the news, um, by looking at the Twitter stream, by reading what other people are saying and effectively repackaging it. So journalism and how younger generations view what journalism is and what quality journalism might sh or should look like, that has also changed. I don't think it's changed for the better. Hmm. I think it has made it very, very confusing um, what news looks like, what commentary looks like, what repurposed, repackaged content looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is a distinction that is getting blurrier and blurrier by the day. Yeah. D does AI have a role here, do you think? Does AI have a role? Um, AI certainly has a role in the future of the news business. Whether or not AI has a role in fixing this, I'm not sure yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming the second part is what you're asking. Yeah. Does AI have a role in fixing this? Um, I guess a lot of the logistical aspects of news creation, I mean, can we, can we automate some of those things? What we can automate with artificial intelligence is um, structured data news creation. Mm. Oh, that's a lot of buzzwords. Okay, let me retry that. There are certain types of reporting that are effectively looking at structured data and interpreting it. Okay, a lot of business reporting looks like this. Uh, reporting on sports scores look like this. And those are things that artificial intelligence absolutely can do. They can do it today. Mm. Right? In fact, a lot of people don't realize this. Last year during the Rio Olympics, the reason why news organizations like, for instance, the Washington Post were so good during the Rio Olympics was because their Twitter account would publish before anyone else the results of uh, of of these these uh, you know the Olympic events, mm. and then when you click through, you would have these short little snippets of what actually happened. My understanding is 75, 80 percent of that, maybe even higher, was all done by machine. So it's just structured data coming from the Olympic Committee going into a machine, and the machine there were templates already written by journalists, mm -hmm. and it was plug and play. The data came in, they plugged it in, they knew who won, they knew who got silver, and they knew what the times were, and they knew the context around it, and then it, boom, it was immediately out, literally within seconds of the end of the, the race or the, the match. Um, same with indices, same with a lot of commodity business reporting, mm -hmm. how a stock moves up and down, um, earnings reports, stuff like this. So that kind of reporting, it, it turns out that machines can do it more accurately and certainly faster than, than mm -hmm. humans. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that human reporters are not going to continue to be incredibly important for our understanding of the world and our and and, uh, and, and the news industry. AI taking over a lot of this commodity news reporting means that journalists, reporters, uh, are able to be freed up to go deep. Mm -hmm to write the kind of journalism that holds governments accountable, that changes society, that actually educates us about the context of the world we live in. For, for I guess, a, an organization which has a, a bit of a, a head start in implementing some of the technologies, I guess, you know, you're quite new Wait, to... hold on. You're talking about the SMP? <laughs> Shortly. Okay. Uh, oh, so for some of the, let's say, American organizations that are a little bit um, up the curve on using technology, how... 
how much of the reporting, I guess, like how many articles are, are they pushing out every day using technology versus kind of the handwritten form? What would be your? Um, that I can't speak to. Okay. I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not sure. Okay. Do you, have a, do you have a ballpark idea on just generally how many stories they're publishing a day or a week? Uh, newspapers? Yeah. I, I can Take tell it. you from, from our point of view. Sure. Um, the South China Morning Post is publishing anywhere from 900 to 1,000 articles a week. A week, okay. And that is still low. So we're comparing ourselves against major news organizations that are global that are probably publishing between 8 to 10 times that per week. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of it has to do with the fact that in this new day and age of news, it's really, really easy to take a single story and report it in a thousand different ways. Um, actually, that is actually um, the, the Washington Post ideology is to report a, a story in a hundred ways, I think, not a thousand, but a hundred ways. Uh, and what that means is effectively taking the core of a story and being able to write it from perspectives of all the different constituents that they are serving. Mm -hmm. Right, um, and and effectively break apart and atomize that story into all the different you know, a story specifically targeted at millennials that is published on only Facebook that is um, you know a video format to a long form article that is published in the weekend newspaper for the traditional print readers. Right, so so that's why you can generate so much content. So, so this brings into I guess the scope like a, a wide product mix really. So yeah. How can you take that one story really and present it to? Different different walks of life across different mediums in different formats. Yeah, uh, you have to have very good technology, <laughs> and you have to have very good people. It has to be a combination of both. Very good technology allows you to actually uh, collect stories and organize them in your back end as assets. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay, this is getting really specific, but effectively headlines, subhead. Here's a nut graph. Here is the opening paragraph. Here is uh, you know the, the body of the of the of the article. Um, here are the pictures that come along with it, ordered and ranked. Here's a a iPhone video snippet that could be packaged together as part of the all of these things. And then here are a dozen different tags about what this uh, for the what the story is about. Those can be reassembled by good technology. Those can be reassembled into many different versions of the story hopefully all with the same truth, right, and all with the same objectivity, but packaged in a way that um, is, is addressing different demographics. Mm -hmm. So, all right, so I guess, tell me now, where are you today, I guess, versus this future that we're talking about, potentially um, repackaging certain um, news in different formats for certain audiences? Like, where are you today versus where do you kind of see yourself evolving? Yeah, uh, SCMP is, is admittedly very, very early on in the process. Um, we are, from a data perspective, where we are right now is we are rebuilding our backend infrastructure and we're starting to learn how best to capture the right data and how best to analyze it for the sake of actually company operation. So that's step one. Capture the right data, know how to read it so you can operate your business better. Um, the next step would be to start feeding or building the machine learning backend so that you can start feeding your data into the machine learning backend so that the actual the, the, the algorithms start learning. Uh, and then from there on, um, you have forks, right, in, in what you want to pursue. That intelligence should, first of all, make the user experience better. Okay, news is no longer a, a, a singular experience for all of us. Right, a unified experience. It used to be the newspaper you got was the exact same newspaper I got. And if we read it from A1 to A20, we would effectively have the same news experience, right? colored only by our own personal context. Now the expectation is that when I open a news app, when I go to a news website, when I go to, on Facebook or Twitter or wherever, anywhere else, wherever I discover content, it's personalized to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so the data in our backend should help improve our user experience so it feels much more personalized than it does today. Mm -hmm. And then of course, eventually we'll get to the artificial intelligence that allows for natural language generation, which is the kind of commodity news creation that I was talking about earlier. Uh, and also natural language processing, which is me talking to a smart speaker and saying, okay, Google, um, tell me what's going on with Steve Bannon today. And then my Google Home reading back to me mm -hmm. uh, that the latest SCMP story about Steve Bannon and, and what he said while he was in Hong Kong. Sure. So yeah. on, on this on this topic, I guess, of personalization and the, I guess, the different discovery platforms and the way people are 
getting their information, do people really know the SCMP? Like, I guess from a print perspective, here, you know, print is a physical newspaper, it has your logo on it. If I'm getting a link through Facebook or elsewhere, or maybe even Snapchat, I'm not sure if you guys have a Snapchat channel, but if I'm getting this information, do I even know it's SEMP? Do I am even aware if this is fact, opinion? Yeah. Yeah, it's and, actually... And like, how does that impact your business? Uh, because a lot. information's flowing so fast. People are reading headlines, they read the first paragraph, and they flip to the next article. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's impacted a lot. The way that news looks online is something that news organizations are still to figure out. Uh, the fact that, you're, again, the same story looks different on all the different platforms. Wherever you discover it, it's going to look different. So are we, are we customizing it for all those platforms? Probably not yet. On top of that, one major issue you've brought up is the fact that because the newspaper and the brand itself has been atomized by social networks primarily, people no longer recognize uh, what the news brand is. In fact, a lot of times they don't pay attention to it. Uh, there was a, there was a, uh, gosh, I forgot. I think it was a Reuters survey that found 50% of millennials who consume news through social networks uh, in the United States. Okay, it sounds like a very specific demographic, but it is a huge demographic. 50% uh, of them do not recognize, they don't even pay attention to what the publisher name is. They just see a headline or a picture, they click on it, they read it, they decide to share, and then they move on, right? And of course, the dirty little secret in Twitter is that for a very, very long time, Twitter's click-through rate for news articles has been abysmal. Uh, it, it's 1.5%, maybe less than that for most news articles at this point. And yet the share numbers continue to grow, which means that most people are sharing news articles on Twitter without ever reading them. So they're sharing it based on effectively 120 characters that you use for your headline. Hmm. So the, 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 the actual, the, the unit of news that we have today has to be adjusted. Um, but at the same time, and I, I don't, don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying that we should be okay as a news industry or as human society that people are consuming news 120 character segments. We do have to adjust, but at the same time, we have to have an accountability to teach the world what real news looks like to elevate media literacy, which I think news organizations around the world have not been held account to and themselves have probably not been thinking anywhere near enough about. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we challenge ourselves with at the South China Morning Post on a daily basis. Do you think you can augment, I guess, the way people um, retrieve their news from the perspective of maybe getting involved in the product mix itself, perhaps owning a distribution channel, creating a product or something which people can, I guess, more strongly identify with a brand? Say, for example, you're growing your business in the United States, for example, they're clicking through headlines, they don't understand the SCMP. Is there something you can do to kind of reinforce that brand through owning a distribution channel? Yeah, so um, here's the playbook. Well, here's the understanding. And, and, that and that's a bit done. of a shift from media to, to the product or tech side. Yeah, exactly. This is, a, this is a product user experience issue. Um, so first of all, we have to, I think, accept at this point that distribution has been disintermediated. That news organizations, we no longer own it, and we have to play with it. The question of, you know, is, is, uh, is Facebook a friend or an enemy? Irrelevant question. Because it doesn't matter whether or not you think Facebook is a friend or an enemy, you have to play within their sandbox. You have to care about Google and SEO, right? Mm -hmm. It's not good necessarily for the, the, the industry, but you have to care about it. So assuming that we now accept we have to play in those platforms, the playbook is, Find your audience in those platforms. Make sure your product is packaged correctly for those platforms so that people will actually click. Once they see your first article, once they click through to that first article of yours or the first video, your job now will be to incentivize them to enter into a one-on-one -on -one relationship with you as the publisher. That sometimes means to give you their email so that they sign up for a newsletter. The newsletter yeah. industry, by the way, email newsletters is exploding because people are realizing that it is, at this point with distributed media model, the primary way of re-engagement with your one-on-one -on -one user. For okay? as high-tech as we are. Yes, for we're, as high-tech as we are. We're going back to emails. That's right. Okay. 
You could get them to download an app, which is becoming increasingly more difficult. You could get them to like your page so that at the very least you have more direct targeting capabilities to their newsfeed, right? Uh, and there are a couple of other ways that you could get them to, to, to enter into a relationship with you. In China, very specifically, it's get them to add you on WeChat. In the United States, increasingly so to get them to add you on Facebook Messenger, right? So these are all direct channels that you have to incentivize people after the first click when they discover you, whether it's Google or Facebook, after that first click, you're trying to get them into that ownership funnel, that relational funnel. Hmm. All right, it's like so, dating. <laughs> something I know little, very little about. Yeah, right me now. too. Yeah. Yeah. Thankfully for both of us, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So how many people, you know, let, let's fast forward uh, a handful of years, say five years from now. Well, currently, I guess how many people are, uh, what would be the metric? How many people are, how many followers do you have? How many readers do you have on like a monthly basis? Um, just where are you sort of right now? We are growing fast. You're growing fast. That's okay. where we are. Let me rephrase that. Where, where, sh where do you hope to be in three, five years time? You know, the, the, uh, the paradigm of scale that we're working in right now is so ridiculous at this point. Mm -hmm. You don't get noticed until you're at 50 million monthly active users. Major news organizations around the world, 100, 150 million monthly active users. Mm -hmm. Most people don't know the world's largest online news organization. Actually, does anyone know what the world's largest online news organization is by scale? Anyone want to shout it out? BBC. Not BBC. Not CNN. I'm not hearing it, so I'm just going to give you the answer. Mm -hmm. Times of India. It's Times Internet. Times Internet says that their monthly active user base is 250 million people. Mm -hmm. 250 million people. It's actually larger than that because 250 million people is only their user base in India. They so don't care about the rest of the world, they only count their Indian users, okay? And so we're talking about a world in which you don't get noticed until you are at 50 million. I, I used to work at Dig, and I worked at the, the, I guess, the Phoenix Rising from the Ashes version of Dig. Uh, and we were always compared to what Dig used to be, because Dig was Reddit before Reddit. And everyone always talks about the past of Dig as the glory days, right? And, uh, and, and it would always make fun of us as the, you know, we, you guys, try, oh, that's so cute. You guys tried to revive the brand. How's that going, right? Um, and I always have to remind them that last year, Dig was averaging about uh, 10 to 12 million monthly active users on own and operated, another 40 to 60 million reach on social. The old version of Dig, the Kevin Rose version of Dig, at its best, when it was considered the most impactful and important content discovery site on Earth, was at 40 to 45 million monthly active users. And it was one of the largest websites on Earth. So the context has completely shifted. You get to 50 million, people start saying, okay, that's big enough mm -hmm. for me to maybe spend ad dollars with you, right? For me not to buy you through a Google network or just spend money on Facebook. Uh, and then for you to be noticed, considered to be in the, 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 the world of the major media partners, it is 100 million. So I, I guess... Okay. So I didn't answer your question. <laughs> you never answered it, but that was a nice uh, it, it, Listen, I, the, uh, we hope that over the course of the next five years, we can get to a global scale that puts us in those ranks, or at the very least, if not that scale, certainly the impact that allows us to, uh, to, to, to actually tell the story of China to a global audience. So in terms of the definition, I guess, of success, like when you talk to Joe and Jack for your review, you know. You make it sound like I actually have a real personal relationship with those two men. You know, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I wish. So, so when, you, when you talk to them a few years down the line, it, it'll be less of a, you know, we hit this many million users this month, and more of a we hit this type of impact so it'll be a broader definition i think it's a sense. combination um the way we look at success right now is reach engagement and impact mm -hmm. the reach metric will become less and less important because a reach metric today uh has led to a commodity advertising and monetization marketplace that you, is you extremely could just do videos all day actually yeah like it's it's really really damaging to the yeah. industry and advertisers are understanding that now, too, because it's a race at the bottom on price. And so they're realizing they can spend a bunch of money and they can get a bunch of eyeballs, but those eyeballs aren't converting to anything. And so the reach metric will degrade in its importance and other things like impact and, uh, and engagement. So effectively, a quality measure will become much more important. 
is it is it tempting to go after that reach, I guess, in the near term? Or is there a, I guess, do you have time, I guess, to develop the product? Um, we uh, we again, have you, to. You could just create a bunch of Panda videos and say. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we have to look for reach. Mm -hmm. We have to because we're, we're too small right now. We are, uh, as of today, a we're a local newspaper with global ambitions and certainly spurts of global impact. And that's not good enough for the South China Morning Post. That's not good enough for, for our people. That's not good enough for our brand. Um, and we are pushing to not only be the paper record for Hong Kong and to continue to serve that need, but to be a, 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 a player with global impact. And so we have to search for reach, but we will not lower ourselves to that common denominator. We can't because our brand, which is, it really represents the trust that we have with our readers and users, that's too important, that's sacred. You have only cat and panda videos, which are awesome, but if you only do cat and panda videos, or you know, honestly, within China context, if you only post videos of the crazy car accidents on the street and, uh, and brides dragging cheating husbands down the road, you know, all, all that stuff, you do that, you lose your credibility and authority with your readers, and it doesn't matter if we get to scale, we will never have the impact that, uh, that we want as a brand. Sure. Um, so time is a bit limited. I have one more question, which is, I guess, for the, perhaps for those working in media or some of the students here looking to eventually work in media in some capacity, again, the industry is in a state of flux, and it's moving so fast, even potentially too fast for media companies. How can people who are currently in the industry or those looking to it, how can they kind of future-proof themselves? What would you recommend they do to stay on top of things in this changing yeah. environment? Um, future proof. It's a, it's a, that's a really good question. There's a number of things that you can do. First of all, pay attention to global, to, to an array of media organizations around the world, not just the big ones. I think most of you here who care about media will say, I read the New York Times or I read the Guardian and I know what BBC and CNN are doing. Uh, pay attention to smaller players that are doing really, really innovative new things, right? Know what Quartz and um, and Vox Media are doing in the United States. Know the kind of journalism that Sixth Tone is generating um, out of China. Um, know what Rappler is doing um, out of Southeast Asia, yeah, the Philippines. Uh, know these organizations, and there there are. I mean, I can list out another two dozen that that warrant your attention. Secondly. Understand that this consumer behavior we're talking about is changing rapidly and that generational gaps are now 10 years apart, not 30. Mm. So um, as awkward as it sounds, pay attention to what teens are using on their phones, right? Because those folks, by the time you're in positions of uh, executive leadership and strategy creation in this industry, uh, will be the ones that are a primary, not the not the only, but a primary target um, demographic, and their media consumption discovery behaviors might be completely different than even Snapchat. So those are the two things I would say to do to future-proof. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you. All right. So I guess we have time for a handful of questions. I, well, right here in the front, because that's all we could see before the lights turned on. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Uh, very interesting comments. I'm, uh, I'm Michael from the Economist Intelligence Unit. Um, I have two questions for you. Um, one, I guess, is relatively straightforward. The other is a little bit more maybe challenging. Um, the first one is, uh, should social media platforms be held responsible for fake news on their platforms? Um, and how, if so? And then the second question is, um, after the South China Morning Post was purchased by Alibaba, it raised a lot of questions about the editorial independence of the organization. Um, essentially, how do you how do you answer those questions? Yeah, the second one is really really easy. Um, I think the, uh, the 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 Jack and Joe have been pretty transparent with the the marketplace, whether or not you want to believe them. I think that the question at this point is not whether or not they've said anything about it, it's whether or not you want to believe them. And what they've said is that the editorial decisions are made in the newsroom and not in the boardroom. And they sincerely have stuck to it, certainly the nine months that I've been here. And that is something that we keep sacrosanct within our organization as well. So the editor-in-chief and the newsroom of the South China Morning Post have full editorial independence. 
every time we meet with the board, the board will again say, listen, I just want to make sure because there's always these rumors, there's always these conversations happening in the marketplace. Uh, you, is there anything that we're doing that you feel like we're having conversations about that are intruding on editorial independence? And that will be a conversation and there will be an assertion that in South China Morning Post remains an editorially independent newspaper. That is extremely important for us. You will see plenty of people within the organization, this version of the organization, this reinvention of the company, leave if that ever changes. Uh, and so that's a pretty good indicator, right? If you see a bunch of senior level folks, especially the senior editors, um, decide to bugger out, then 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 dig, right? Then then figure out. But I feel very strongly and very confidently that we continue to maintain editorial independence and that will be something as CEO that I will fight for on a daily basis. So that's your second question. The first one is much harder to answer. So let's uh, let's let let's call a spade a spade. We're talking about Facebook. When you say social media, you're talking about Facebook. Um, I don't think it's just Facebook's responsibility. Yes, Facebook has a role to play. I think early on, a year ago, when Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg were planting their flag and saying, we are just a platform, we don't have accountability for fake news, um, they were wrong. And they've realized that and they've completely changed their tone. They do have a role to play and they're actually doing, they're experimenting, right? They are using um, partnerships and data to at the very least now be able to tag news that they believe to not necessarily be true, right? as questionable news effectively. So it's, that's a start. But it's not just about them. It's about the fact that, I, and I've called out other news organizations, including our own, um, New York Times does this, the, the, the Washington Post does this, Guardian does this, we do this, where we ourselves in social media do not Actually, Kevin, you mentioned this, and I, again, I didn't answer this at all. I didn't respond to it. We, we don't separate clearly enough what is opinion and what is news. We know what opinion and news, what the difference is. But on social media, it lo all looks the same, right? Because it's easier to get somebody to click on opinion because the, the, the headlines are probably more controversial. It probably sounds and looks juicier. So if I don't call it opinion or commentary and it's just like it's written almost as fact, uh, people are gonna click on it more. So I think we have a tendency as a news organization to not care as much about media literacy as we ought to. So the platforms have an accountability. The news publishers have an accountability. Certainly education institutions around the world also, I think, have an accountability to raise the level of media literacy. So it has to be collective. It won't be easy to solve. Let's uh, flip across here, this gentleman on this side. Thank you, Gary, for your interesting conversation. I'm actually a student from uh, the University of Hong Kong. So just now you mentioned that SMP's mission and mission is to let the world understand China in a better way. So how do you actually position SEMP like, as compared to leading Chinese English newspaper like China Daily? What can I read from SEMP that I cannot get from China Daily? So this is my first question. And my second question is that um, uh, how, it seems that you are not very satisfied with how the West portray China nowadays. So what do you think can be improved? Like, or do you think the NYT or CNN is really biased in their way of portraying China? Thank you. All right, so the first question is the difference between SCMP and China Daily. Um, we are not a propaganda organ of the Beijing government, so that's the difference. So what you can get from us that you can't get from China Daily is a lot of times, objective news. You can't get the other side of the story. There's a lot of stuff that China Daily just will never ever write about, and we can and will write about it because it is important for our readers, it's important for not only Hong Kong, but for the rest of the world. So I, hopefully, hopefully you guys actually understand and see that difference. If not, and a lot of people who don't see that difference is because they're taking the easy way out and they're just repeating and parroting a lot of things that they hear in the marketplace. I challenge you to read the newspaper every single day, to read our product and read the China Daily product on a daily basis and see the difference, okay? So that's the first one. The second one is bias is a very strong word, okay? And I, I don't like using it, and I'm not gonna use it in this case. But I will say this. 
because of the context of the New York Times, because of the marketplace that it addresses, because of where the uh, where the the, the, the the main demographic of user base is, New York Times is going to view China from a very specific point of view. And it's not a wrong point of view. It is a point of view. I believe that there are other points of view. Um, this is one thing that I've repeated often uh, since the last couple of months, and, and I've stolen it from somebody much, much smarter than me. And they said that Western media organizations have a tendency to report on China in just three ways. Big China, bad China, weird China. Okay, and, and I think that's actually relatively accurate. And there's so much more to China than just those three things. Those three things are important. Because a lot of the context and the stories of China are, they, they can fall into those three buckets. But there's so much more. And so when I say that the South China Morning Post can offer a different perspective, it is to fill out that perspective. It is to create a comprehensive picture and provide nuance and texture to the story of China in a way that Western organizations, because of who they serve, who they are, right, and just overall their context probably cannot and do, and do not today, and I frankly do not today. All right, I guess on the right side, somewhere there. Sure. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Nina Xiang. I'm the co-founder of China Money Network. I have two questions. One is, do you have any uh, innovative um, ways of monetizing uh, the South China Morning Post platform? Uh, second question is, um, do you sometimes feel like content um, uh, you know, just just as a form is perhaps in the end old, uh, end road. The reason I'm saying this is because think about uh, Mobike. Uh, in under two years, the company has secured about a hundred million registered users just by dumping a bunch of bikes on the street. Um, think about Amazon. Uh, Twenty million smart speakers sold, and therefore twenty million. An entry point into uh, people's, uh, you know, family life and their, their digital life. So content is, has content has really fallen uh, to a very low place in people's digital lives, and they're going to probably probably fall more in the future. So, um, what's your thinking on that? Thank you. Sorry, um, I, I, I'm so fascinated by your second question. I totally forgot about the first one. What was the first one? Monetization. Oh, monetization. Um, so, uh, okay. I, right now, I do not have any innovative, new, brilliant monetization strategies to share with those of you who are in the media space right here. I, I just, I don't. Um, it doesn't mean that the South China Morning Post won't be experimenting with some interesting ways over the course of the next few years. But I, I honestly think that the industry as a whole is adjusting. Is adjusting to that changing consumer behavior and adjusting to the new reality of monetization. I'm not going to bore you with numbers, but it looks bad, right? Um, and and even with digital growing in this year, 2016, this past year, actually 2017 is going to be the first year where digital advertising globally is going to be at the same level, the same size as TV advertising, top line TV advertising. 38% of the marketplace, both of those two things. And so people will say, digital advertising finally matured. You digital media players must be making a lot of money. But that growth and digital advertising is the only one that's growing. It's growing by about 20% um, year over year. That growth is all, it, it's completely monopolized or duopolized by, by Facebook and Google. 98% um, of the growth in digital advertising revenue in the United States is by these two organizations. Everyone else is fighting for the 2% of growth that's left over. So the monetization um, marketplace is completely broken for media. And we as a collective industry need to figure this out together. right? Collective. In the United States, the major news organizations in the past have not ever been able to talk to one another about these things because it was considered collusion. So there are actual federal laws that prohibit the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal from actually talking and collectively bargaining against networks like Google and Facebook. These news organizations and, uh, and effectively their, um, well not effectively, their lobbyists, there's one in particular called the Alliance. It's a very sinister name. They're not a, very, they're not a sinister organization. I can see a movie coming. Yeah, they, they are lobbying Washington to change the law so that news organizations can actually collectively bargain against platforms because we're getting killed on monetization. So all this to say, 
I certainly have not figured it out. And me individually, or even South China Morning Post individually as an organization, will not figure it out without participation with the entire industry. Okay. The second one, what was so interesting about that question is that you equate, well, the two things that are interesting about that second question. The first thing is uh, that you equate Mobike and Amazon hardware as the same thing. Um, I see those two things completely differently. Okay. One is a marketplace platform and product, um, and it's, it's, about a, it's about an industry of uh, an economy of access, right? Um, the other is actually a platform from content distribution. So the fact that 20 million uh, Alexas have been sold should be a great sign for content businesses. Because it suddenly means that content can be delivered through audio while you're doing whatever else in, in your home. Okay? And that is one of those advantages that news organizations are not thinking anywhere near enough about. Some of you have also heard me say this before today. This moment in time is the golden age for news because we have more channels of contact with our readers and our users than we've ever had before. We have access to exponential scale in a way we've never had before. And we have more canvases for storytelling, more innovative, more interesting, more engaging and compelling canvases for storytelling than we've ever had before. So as a news organization, we should be in a position where we're not complaining about the changes that the internet has brought. We know it's a challenge, but we should be reveling in the fact that we can tell the story of the world to so many more people in so many more compelling ways. And Alexa and audio is one of those ways. We've seen the podcast industry triple in the United States over the course of the last four years, right? And everyone thought radio was dead, but now there's a new format and a new delivery channel for a podcast that means that if I'm at home and washing the dishes and my wife is gonna make a face because I never wash the dishes, but let's assume for that one spectacular night when I'm washing the dishes, I can be listening to BBC World News, I can be listening to uh, NPR from New York, I can be listening to uh, the, hopefully the South China Morning Post podcast on what's going on in China, all of those things. So, in my opinion, no, content is not in an end road. In fact, right now is when we should be taking off as an overall industry. So I just shouted at you. I know that Alice initially you're, said you're very not to shout at you. So I apologize for, for that. I was just, I'm passionate about this. Uh, can we get another question just a couple rows ahead, I guess, with your hand up? Right there, yeah. Um, hi, my name is Erin. I'm a journalist. Um, so I have an old fashioned question for you. I know your background is tech, but um, Hong Kong media has an ongoing issue with self censorship. Um, so how can I guess what is your view on that? And how can we keep Hong Kong media from becoming like Singapore, where you have the editors of the Straits Times, you know, working for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and such? So how can we keep it more open? So to be very frank, I'm not the best person to ask about that question. I'm Coming on nine months into the city, I'm still learning a lot about the media space here in Hong Kong. I'm not naive about it. I have paid attention to it over the course of the last few years and certainly heard all of the commentary actually on both sides. Here's what I would say to that. The first thing is that, um, for the love of God, Hong Kong media can never become Singapore. And I don't think it ever will. Um, at the very least, in, in this day and age, and in, in the way we see the city today, I, I sure as heck hope it won't. Um, it's not going to be, it will have to be, there will have to be a massively drastic shift to everything about Hong Kong, including One Country, Two Systems, for that to be the case. Because media is part of, part of public policy, it's part of governance in Singapore. Right, media is part of governance. It's part of governance strategy in Singapore. Um, whereas here, we do actually enjoy incredible freedoms of press. We really do. I, I know that these NDCs are saying otherwise, but the fact that we have these absurd arguments in press, we have so many differing points of view that are so far apart and are constantly attacking one another, right? And we have people that are constantly calling out the Hong Kong government, um, calling out business people, calling out Beijing. Those, for us, should all be signals of the vibrant free press we have in Hong Kong. 
Okay, the fact that new media organizations are springing up all over the place. Yes, I know, they're struggling in some ways, like getting official access to certain uh, government press events and stuff like that. I understand that there's still struggle and challenges and there's still evolution that needs to happen. But new news organizations are popping up all over the place. Those are signals of having vibrant free press. So from my point of view, having been an observer of how press looks all around the world, right? And even coming from what everyone sees as the bastion of free press in the United States, I say that in the last nine months, having talked to a lot of people in the industry and learning and asking a lot of questions, I strongly believe that Hong Kong enjoys incredible free press, but it is something that needs to be protected. And the SCMP will stand with all the other news organizations here in Hong Kong protecting it. Do we have time for one more? Right, right there. I want to talk about the dreaded pivot to video. Um, as in, you know, there's one of the, if, if you follow media Twitter, um, a lot of the things that journalists are fearful of is their media company says, we're pivoting to video, half of you are laid off. Um, MTV News went through this, Mike News went through this, BuzzFeed, I think, is going through, has gone through this. Um, I guess in short, kind of, kind of, kind of, what do you think about the, you know, quote unquote pivot to video strategy? Is it chasing, I think you said, is it, is it chasing the last fad? Um, was it ever something that had any basis in fact at all? Yeah, it's, it's also, I think for me, easy to answer. I don't think it's a fad at all. I think it's a new choice of consumption behavior for younger generations because the phone, the smartphone is such an incredible video consumption device that um, it's made it easy to consume video. And it's made it more compelling to tell stories through video. What is hard for the industry, that pivot or that change, which by the way, is not a future thing. It's honestly a past thing, <laughs> a present thing at best, right? Um, it's something that's not going to go away. And it is sad that news organizations, because of the economics of our industry, has ha have had to choose either or. That to actually increase video production capacity, have had to lay off people who are more traditional in their skill set or in the written word. And it's very, very sad. I certainly hope that at the SEMP, um, we will have the opportunity to incrementally build into video, to continue to protect and 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 innovate the written word format, because there's still very, very real quality uh, and need there, as well as build incremental video capacity. That's my hope. Video's not going to go away, that is a reality, and we have to adjust, um, and we have to be able to tell the same comprehensiveness of story through video formats uh, that we used to tell through 800 to 1200 word uh, articles, and that's not, not, not easy at all. So we're still, we're still figuring it out. All right, I think we have to wrap it up there. I want to quickly thank uh, Alice and Asia Society for hosting us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Gary Liu, South China Morning Post. Thank you so much. Gary, thank you. Kevin, thank you. Catherine, thank you. Um, this is kind of discussion we're going to continue. Um, this is, I think, Gary reminds me of my younger self when I arrived in Hong Kong in the 90s. Um, Hong Kong is really in an exciting place. As a Chinese American, there's a lot of stuff happening. Self-censorship, all of the stuff that we talked about, it doesn't happen until unless we make it happen. So I'm really excited that Asia Society Hong Kong has a forum to, to provide this type of discussion. But I have a personal question to ask Gary, because uh, earlier uh, in the dis uh, at the reception, it sounds like your parents and my parents are very similar, doesn't speak much English in the States. What do they think of what you are doing right now, moving to Hong Kong, and uh, you could be uh, a dot-com millionaire, where in, uh, whether it's in the U.S. or in Silicon Valley. But you're right now running a media company, a uh, hundred-year-old media company. How do you explain to them what you're doing? Do they get it? And what kind of media do they consume? Because I spent a, year and a, a month and a half with my parents recently. And right now, in terms of the language... Uh, because there is a generational divide. So I want to ask you that question because that may help me explain to my parents what I do here at Asia Society. 
first off, um, it, it's 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 really hard to become a tech millionaire. Uh, Kev, Kevin, Kath, you guys are you guys are gonna get there because Nodi is such a great product. Um, oh yeah, but it's really hard. So just because if I had stayed there, it would not have guaranteed anything. Um, my parents. It, they're very conflicted because they worked their butts off to move me to the West because they believed that Western education, for whatever reason, they believed that Western education and contextualization was good for me. Um, and they, 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 I mean, they really, they sacrificed, they struggled to make sure that it was possible for me. Um, now they live back in Taipei. And so now that I'm here, they're extremely conflicted. We did so much to make sure that you were there. Now you're back, but we're also happy that you're an hour away and not 16 hours away. Um, so I don't know what they really honestly think. I think right now they're in the honeymoon period. We haven't annoyed them enough by being so close that, uh, that they're, I think that they're generally happy. But when it comes to media, uh, they, they certainly know the South China Morning Post. Um, they know of its reputation because it is such an important news organization to the region. Um, they themselves are trying really, really hard to read it more often, even though their, I mean, their 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 English language is conversational. Uh, but certainly, I think that you know they're, they're trying really hard to understand what we write and how we write it. Uh, but the entire context of the industry uh, is very familiar to them. The way that they consume, my father is a huge news junkie. I inherited it from him, the the uh, the habit. He reads probably four or five newsletters from front page all the way through the back page every single day. And if you know anything about the Taiwan um, news industry, Taiwanese news channels are supremely entertaining. And so 24-7, uh, you can have them on, and there's always somebody screaming at you, saying some absurd thing. So he is constantly watching TV. Um, and uh, my mom, just by osmosis, knows a lot of the crap that's going on as well. So they're huge news junkies, both of them. So thankfully for me, they understand the industry I'm in. The digital tech side, no idea. They just know that I work for a couple of big names in the US tech industry. They have never known what I actually do. Well, uh, on that note, I wanted to share this with you. Um, when I was working in, in New York, Comedia 100 and a Museum of Chinese America, um, they don't know what I do until I was profiled. You probably know this, World Journal. Um, and Gish Jen says this, you are no one as a Chinese American, if your parents does not know uh, a World Journal. And World Journal is a Chinese language paper, kind of like, uh, and if your profile there, so I'm working on getting you a profile World Journal. Because you will make my parents so proud. You are yeah. no one until your profile in a Chinese language. So one of the questions I have for you, I hate to say this, but, but the, you, you have said, in terms of the integration language here in Hong Kong, and right now, and you can do a lot of translation, what is the ambition of SCMP in terms of the, the multi-language? I, I, this is my last question, the, and I'm the, going to present you with the The multi-language? Yes, uh, actually, Chinese. OK. Um, the South China Morning Post will, for the foreseeable, short, mid, probably long-term future, be an English language newspaper. Uh, a lot of people ask why we are not focused on the China in the marketplace, like all of our competitors are, because there's 1.3 billion people right across the border. It's because we believe our value to the world, well, two reasons. First of all, we believe our value to the world is to go out. Because there are, as I am constantly reminded uh, by other people who agree, uh, billions of people outside of China who need to understand China better. And there are plenty of people getting into China to try and get Chinese people to understand the rest of the world, right? Uh, there, there are very few, if any, coming out to help the rest of the world understand China better. That is our value. So I'm pointed outwards, and so English language is going to be our language. The second reason, very, very practically, if I start trying to push my way into China, where we are 100% blocked right now, we're going to run to troubles in the way, with the way that we report. And I just do not want that distraction. I do not want to incentivize our newsroom to change the way we report. So facing out allows us to remain objective, truthful about what China is and how the rise of China is going to change the world. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here.